those lists. <laughs> thank you. Good to have her. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm tempted to find more than I already bought. <laughs> I know it. They're addictive. Yeah, you go out there and you look and say, hey. Oh, I want that one too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good morning, everyone. Ooh, uh, the heater. It is chilly in here. This <laughs> <laughs> thing on. Oh, you do have a heater. <laughs> Not helping hot, over there. <laughs> hot chocolate. <laughs> I wish. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about our favorite roses and how to grow them. I was looking for my old projector, couldn't find it. <laughs> so we'll make do with computers and uh, books. But anyway, the uh, roses are probably still the number one selling shrub in the U.S., although among hobbyists they, they are not as popular as they were 20 years ago, but they're still quite popular. Um, what homeowners really like are what are called the hybrid teas, which are usually the single flower per stem, and they call it a high center. The center of the rose is pretty high in there, whereas the some of the newer roses from Europe uh, that are coming in the English type rose is a different kind of flower. So you can see that this is uh, kind of a the petals are kind of scrambled. Still pretty though. Mm -hmm. There's really not really anything bad to say about it, but in rose shows, they like the ones that have a nice spiral pattern of, of uh, petals and a real high center. So. Now, roses can be as difficult as you'd like them to be. When I was in my 20s, uh, I had a 50 rose rose garden, and I was out there three or four hours a week keeping them perfect. Not a single bad leaf, not a single bad petal. <laughs> wow. uh, when I got married, no, no longer had that kind of time. <laughs> and now if they get an hour a month, they're lucky. But I would tell you that with an hour a month or three hours a week, uh, you can make them look probably about 90% as good as if you spent the entire time on them. <laughs> so you can either make them perfect or you can keep them just nice. Um, Southern California really is the perfect climate for roses. It's hard to beat it because the rain is like the worst thing. When it rains on the roses, they can certainly get diseases on the leaves and flowers. Uh, and we're on the dry side. So here in California, one of the biggest rose companies in the world is Mayland of France. France's climate is kind of similar, probably more similar to Central California. <laughs> But uh, still, uh, dry summers really helps the rose out. On the East Coast, especially in the New England states, they can have loads of problems with rain, or you know, the southern states with uh, all kinds of diseases when the water hits the leaves. So generally, uh, with roses, if you sprinkle them in the morning, it's not a big deal. Um, the water on the leaf has to sit there for at least four hours wet to cause trouble. Now if it's raining, it's not a problem either. When, it, when the rain's coming down, the uh, new drops of water keep knocking off any disease that try to start on the leaf. But once that rain stops or the irrigation stops and the water drops sit there for four or five hours, that's when you start getting diseases. Now if the temperature is like it is today, uh, or even colder, like it might be in January, not a big problem. We don't get that many diseases in the middle of winter because it's just too cold for the diseases to operate. Diseases like to be closer to 50, 60 degrees. So late winter, early spring, if it's still raining on the leaves, you get a lot of diseases from that. But right in the middle of winter, if it's a cold winter, uh, the rain's not going to hurt them much. Now we don't get any frost bad enough to ever hurt a rose. Usually it's the wind that does most of the damage to the leaves, but uh, we don't get cold enough here to, to really hurt them much at all, or at all, <laughs> period. So the, road, the cold you don't worry about. Um, the record temperature here was, I think, 23 degrees back in 1990. That might have been cold enough to cause a little damage, but I don't recall it doing anything. They were still fine. So compared to the rest of the country, we're pretty... Uh, pretty mild. Now, one of the big mistakes the rose growers made 
is that the roses they bred were for this area. In fact, uh, Jackson and Perkins, which at one time was the biggest nursery in the world. I mean, they, you know, they sent a catalog to every household in the U.S. Mm -hmm. back in the 1980s and 90s. They're, they're no longer the same company, but their breeding ground for 20 years was in Irvine. So for 20 years, all the roses they sent out were perfect for Irvine, horrible on the East Coast. And I think that's one of the problems that the rose growers saw is that, you know, everybody from the East Side of the United States was saying, well, these roses are too difficult to grow. So they started uh, putting test gardens over the country to figure out which ones were good where. So that's, they're doing a better job of that now, but I think it kind of hit too late for Many people, they think roses are just too tough, especially on the east side of the United States. Um, now, we're selling bare roses right now. So they'll come without any dirt on them. So this is a bare rose that's been pruned for, for planting. Uh, the roots came to us kind of short like that. Sometimes you get much longer roots than that, but that is a this happens to be a budded bare root rose versus, I didn't bring a sample of a own root rose, but generally the way they make <laughs> these is this piece right here is a stem or was a stem of a climbing rose. They cut it off and stuck this four inch piece, might be five inches long, into the ground and it made roots. And then they, on the side of this stem, they put a cut in there, stuck in a bud of this rose, which is called Sugar Moon, and then cut the top of the rose off, and this bud starts to grow and makes this little bush here. So most of the roses we get in are on this climbing rose called Dr. Huey, and this is the uh, Sugar Moon on top of it. And if anything grows from this part, we call it a sucker, because Dr. Huey will come out of this. So there's a lot of Dr. Huey roses out there intentionally, uh, which are burgundy flowers that bloom once and get mildew real bad. So, um, so you want to make sure that nothing comes from the bottom. Now, if it's grown on its own roots, when they grow roses on their own roots, they just take a piece of this stem of sugar moon and stick it in the dirt and it grows its own roots. And they're doing that more and more now because, uh, uh, especially in the colder parts of the country, if you get a bad frost and the top of the plant freezes, then all you have left is Dr. Huey. Now, this rose was grown in the field, and you can kind of see where the green ends right here. It was this high in the field. Uh, and the major rose growing area in the United States is near Fresno, just south of Fresno, near the city of Wasco. Um, for decades, probably 90% of the roses in the United States were grown right there. And the reason for that is because that area of the country, the soil and the climate are perfect. What they've got is they've got fairly heavy soil there, but that makes the roots quite short and fine textured. Like they used to grow roses in Hemet, out that in the desert areas. And it's real sandy soil, but the problem they had with those roses, and we used to buy them from them, Howards of Hemet, grew roses, and they had one root on the bottom that went straight down 10 feet because of the soil they had. So they dug out the rose, you get one root on her. Uh, so that wasn't too good, so they quit growing them there. But in the Central Valley, with that heavier soil, the roots are, tend to be finer and closer to the surface. Plus, uh, starting in November in that area, they get a lot of fog there, called Thule fog. And so when they started harvesting these roses with big plows, they just plow them right out of the ground. Um, they can just leave them there as, and collect them leisurely off the surface because they're not drying up. It's just totally fogged over for weeks on end in, in that area. <coughs> so the rose growers all settled there. Plus it's dry in the summer, no diseases at all. Now this rose is two years old. They used to grow three-year-old roses. So back in the 60s, the roses were three years old. The stems were much thicker. Beautiful plants. But they, to save money, starting I think in the 90s, they started making a two-year crop. Now the rose growers up there, uh, it's a two-year crop. 
it's a five year cycle. So two years they grow the roses in the ground and then for three years they grow some other kind of farm crop. Because you can't grow roses in the same soil that quickly. So when they harvest the roses out of the ground, half the root system's left in the dirt. And so that ground there is full of rotting rose roots. You put another crop of roses right into that, they don't grow. They didn't kill them, but they just don't grow. They don't like their own dead relatives in the ground next to them. <laughs> so the same thing happens in your yard too. If you're replanting a rose garden, do not plant in the same soil. Uh, and I've done that. Back in the 80s, we heard about the rose replant syndrome. I had a 50 rose rose garden. I was replacing roses every year because I got bored pretty easily. For the first two or three times I did it, which the rose garden was less than a few years old, there was no issues. The roses did fine, but by the third or fourth year in the ground, when I replaced the rose, the darn thing would bloom once, not grow more than a few inches the entire year, and just sit there next to roses that were thriving. So the new rose going into the where the old rose was wasn't a good idea at all. And even if it was just between two other roses that were four feet apart, put them right between there, that didn't work either because you had to cut through rose roots to make that hole and then put them in, they wouldn't grow. I finally pulled that part of the rose bed out, put hibiscus in, they did fine, they didn't care. So that's rotating crops and or replacing dirt. So one of our employees who has a 100 rose rose garden also got bored easy. And he told me that one bag of our acid mix replaced what he dug out of that hole. The rose would do fine in that, and he and he saw no evidence of any replant syndrome when he just replaced the dirt with something clean. Uh, sand works, that works. You can dig a hole, you know, ten feet away from the roses in another part of the garden to switch the dirt, and they would do fine too. Um, now roses don't care about soil quality that much as long as it's well drained. So if you have clay soil, and they do have clay soil where they grow the roses in the Central Valley that doesn't bother them as long as it's well drained. Well drained in the Central Valley would mean that they would heal it up <coughs> foot and a half or so above soil level so the rows were not sitting in the low spots on the farm. So that would be good enough. And you can do the same thing if you got clay soil. Now generally if it doesn't say like a little swamp area, you're fine. I used to have a spot in my yard that was next to a sidewalk, and the dirt was lower, and it was muddy in there, and the rose just went <coughs> doo on there. So what we did is we put a few of those wood uh, log things, and just stuck them in there, and raised the dirt about four inches, and then that became a wonderful rose bed. So just raising dirt up that, just that much, turned in from the worst area in my yard to about the best area in the yard. So it doesn't take much soil to, uh, raising up to, to improve that soil quality. Uh, generally with roses, about three feet apart is what we do, although there's no big rules there. I've done a lot of roses two feet apart, not that big a deal. Um, if you isolate, you know, you can put a rose anywhere in your garden, it doesn't really matter. You can put one here, one there, ten in a row. If you have them well spaced and isolated, they tend not to get diseases or bugs as easily. When you've got a row of 10 roses and they get a bug on one end, it usually travels down the whole row. So uh, if you isolate them, uh, even in the worst spot of your garden, I used to have a rose, I bought a house and I had the rose was on the north side. Uh, it shade most of the day, it didn't find. It was all by itself, did not pick up mildew, even though it was a mildew prone variety because it was isolated, just in a location, so. But the sun, it, it, it didn't get much sun and it bloomed well? It bloomed pretty good, yeah. It was between houses, got maybe four hours of direct sun a day. So it wasn't uh, the greatest spot in the world, but it, it looked fine and it performed fine for me, so we just left it there. So they don't have to be. Now, you know, again, it depends on your location too. My father-in-law lived in Hemet. In Hemet, you grow all your roses in the shady side of the yard. <laughs> it's so hot there. He had everything on the north side of his house looked wonderful. 
didn't need the light in Hemet, <laughs> or didn't need much. So, uh, depends where on the beach, you know, you put them 10 feet apart, say. Get more air circulation. Now, uh, air circulation is a big thing, too. So, we had uh, my first house, I had rows all over the front yard. We had a corner lot, so we had a lot of space there. Uh, the roses that were in the parking strip hardly ever got any diseases at all. The air circulation is so good. That's why you know, the meeting strips and highways, boy, get real carefree out there. Um, but I had roses within five feet of my house, always got mildew. Uh, seven foot from the house, they still got mildew. Ten foot from the house, no more. Just that extra little room even away from a solid surface that was blocking the wind and the air movement uh, made a big difference. Uh, I was using iceberg rows, and I noticed the ones that were just a little further away did not get that mildew that they did close to the house. So just the location makes a big difference too. And of course every year is different. Some years we have more overcast weather like this uh, can cause more mildew problems. Uh, sunny, dry weather, not so much. If you are going to plant them fairly close to your house, is there anything to do to help prevent the mildew? You get certain, certain varieties are less mildew prone than others. We kind of mentioned that on there. Um, and there are certainly a lot of treatments for them. Mildew itself is not that difficult. We'll go over the disease in a little bit. Now there's the different categories of roses, so the single flowered ones are hybrid teas. So that's what we use for cutting to make the single big singles like this. In general, but it's general, because there are short hybrid teas too, but most hybrid tea roses, the typical one, five foot tall, leggy at the base. So hybrid tea roses generally are not the greatest thing to put in the front of your garden in the street side of your house because they're leggy. Um, the ones that are more presentable in the front yard are the Floribunda. This actually is a Floribunda rose. Uh, this happens to be Gruenock and that's Helmut Schmidt. But they tend to be, say, three foot tall and mounded those hybrid teas tend to be more like this as far as the top. Floribundas tend to be more mounted with flowers generally in clusters. So more presentable uh, for the front yard. So my own front yard, I've got Floribundas in the front, hybrid teas behind them to hide the legginess of that. And hybrid teas in the backyard. The first, you know, the original roses in the wild just had five petals. And then I guess man got to them pretty quickly and started selecting the ones out that had more petals. So you can have roses now that have uh, over 100 petals on them. This one certainly has a lot. This one's hard to get. Grew an and we've been trying to get it. We've been ordering it for years, and our growers never have any to sell. Some of us be buying them all up. Grew an um, it's considered by many to be one of the very first Floribunda roses out there, and David Austin considered it to be the, the rose that he copied to make his English roses because he loved the look. The thing about the original roses is that most of the wild roses and the early roses only bloomed in the spring. For about three or four months, they'd just have one good big bloom, and they'd be done for the year. Um, and most of the early English rows were the same way. Gorgeous flowers, one bloom a year. So they started crossing those with what are called the uh, tea roses that bloomed over and over and over. And uh, then they got the modern roses from that. So the first modern hybrid tea was supposedly developed in the late 1800s, 1879, <laughs> or something like that. Uh, yellow was not one of the original rose colors. And unfortunately, when they brought yellow into the genes for yellow into the ro main roses, uh, they start picking up more diseases. So the yellow rose genes are the, the ones that are more susceptible to disease. 
So a lot in the last few years, last 20 years or so, they've been going back to the wild roses and interbreeding those with some of the modern ones to get that tendency for disease out of them. So a lot of the current roses are very, very disease free. <laughs> Okay, so when you plant your bare root rows, this year we're worried because the air is so dry compared to last <coughs> year. We've had quite a few years in our own, you know, in the last five that have been very dry. Now, so when you're, you know, the, and on roses in general, if the fluffier the ground is, the more sandy or light textured, more breathable the soil is, the faster and taller the <coughs> rose grows. So in clay soil, you tend to get a shorter plant, and in sandy soil, you tend to get a really tall plant. I had a customer who said he was stationed in Saudi Arabia as a consultant. He had his trailer parked on the sand. He wanted to grow roses. They told me it was crazy in the sand, but he says his roses were over the top of his trailer. Okay. They would grow 10, 12 foot tall. So that's what happens in the, so most florist roses are grown in sand because you get those really long stems. So in my house, yeah, we found out you may not want to put your roses into really sandy soil because they get too tall. I mean, I have Florida Bunnies, my friend, and we did that. The Florida Bunnies roses are five foot. We're going, okay, that, did, that wasn't a good idea. <laughs> and they're still, they grow this high. Florida Bunnies roses, just too big for the, for the location. So, uh, Fluffy soil or making them, you know, taller is maybe not always the best idea. But anyway, they, they do like that good drainage. They like a lot of water. So when you plant them, this was the original soil level. But if you're in Minnesota, you take the same rose and plant it this deep. Because in Minnesota, if this freezes, the plant's dead. So they put them far in the ground where they don't freeze. So back in the 80s, we wanted to check and see what would happen to the rose if you planted it that deep. So we did it, they looked fine. You know, everything was coming out of the dirt, but there was no downfall to that. So if you want to plant your rose this high, or you want to plant it this deep in the ground, it's, it'll do fine. I would say make, make sure the stems stick out of the ground a little bit, but that is fine. It, it doesn't hurt them at all. The only thing you have to watch out for, not in a new bed, but in an old bed, is that any cut tip on your rose, if it's freshly cut, freshly cut root, freshly cut stem, in contact with soil roses that have been grown before, they can catch a disease called bacterial canker. It's not fatal at all, but it causes these cancer-like growths where the cut pieces are, and, it, and it's hard to cure that once they get it. It doesn't usually kill the rose, it's just on site they have this big gall on the side of the trunk. But we found when we're replanting our own rose bed, if I had clipped them and put them in the dirt that day, they would generally get those big knots on them where they were in contact with the dirt. If I clipped them the day before, put them back in a plastic bag, and then plant the next day, it didn't happen. So we made a, um, so one of our instructions to customers is, yeah, if you're doing pruning, try to prune it the day before you plant it to prevent any disease. But again, if your soil hasn't grown roses in there before, you probably won't have any trouble at all. Now, the other thing, you can plant them like this, but if the wind comes up or the air stays real dry, you can put them in the ground, water them real thoroughly, get everything around them real wet and muddy, then slop the dirt up to here on the stems and wait for the new growth to start off the tips. When you see the new leaves start, take that dirt off. Uh, back in the 90s, I said, well, I don't have enough dirt here. I put planter mix on it, burned off every single leaf that tried to come out. So make sure there's no compost in that mix that you, you put around the stems because compost by nature is eating up dead leaves. But it can't tell a dead leaf from a live leaf. So you put compost around your live leaves trying to grow out, it just eats them up too. Compost around foliage is really dangerous. On the stems, it doesn't hurt them, but uh, put them, pile it up on, on the foliage or it'll eat your leaves right off, so don't do that. So I learned my lesson on that. You can use 
Our potting soil doesn't have any compost in it. So you can use that, but don't use anything that's got ground up plant material that, that's called compost. Uh, generally in the ground too, we do not recommend putting compost in the soil at all for any plant really. Uh, it doesn't seem to hurt roses that bad. You know, for 40 years, uh, now for 20 years, we were telling our customers to make, improve the soil by adding compost and the ample quantities of it because that's what we were told. So in my first rose bed I made, and I made it in a raised bed that was raised up a few feet, a uh, foot and a half, we made it like s at least 30% compost mixed with the native soil there. It was a lot of compost. Plant the roses, that was the rose bed I planted them real deep in. Um, the roots that grew off the stems were fine. All the roots that were down deep in that stuff, all these roots were black and rotten after a few years. Because I had pulled the rose out of the ground and I noticed that the roses below six inches in the ground were just black and slimy. I thought I had planted the roses too deep because I didn't know what was going on. Then we figured out later, yeah, too much compost in there. What compost does to the soil is it consumes all the oxygen the roots need to survive and it creates sewer gases on top of that. So all the roots near the surface were fine. They were healthy. The rose had grown a whole new root system on the top, but all the roots that were down a foot deep into that composty soil were black and slimy. They were dead, all rotten off. But the rose had regrown its root system so quickly, I never noticed anything wrong with them. They were fine. So roses are very quick to uh, uh, compensate for all the soil problems you might give them. Yes. So you're saying if we buy if we uh, buy in the uh, bare root roses, and we had roses in there previously, and so how deep should it? I think you said use a whole bag of soil. That's one cubic foot. That's a lot of soil. Okay. So how deep do you dig it down? If I'm planting rose bush right there, you said I could dig it down about what about that? Yeah, one cubic foot, so if you dug a hole 12 by 12 by 12 inches, that would get the, all that soil in there, that'd be enough to put this in. Okay, and then how deep, you said you could plant it about where your fingers, your fingers are all the way up. Well, this is quite a, how it was in the farm. Yeah. If you went up this deep, you're fine. Do you, you have to go up that deep? No, okay, all right. But with the dry air, so for the, it takes a plant, from you know, bare rooting, they pull, they just plow them out of the ground. But all the little roots are torn off. It takes about two weeks for the plant being in back in the ground to restore its root system. And even though roses have a lot of wax on their stems, if the air is dry and the wind's blowing at all, these things can just shrivel up like prunes, and they won't grow. A lot of times, when that happens, they'll sprout. You know, a couple months later from the, from this area that hasn't dried up on them, it takes a long time to recover from that. If you bury the stems temporarily, just slop the dirt over the stems, that'll help keep them from drying out. So are you saying then, about where your index finger and thumb is, if you plant there and then pile the dirt up, uh, mm. just mound it up around those leaves, right. that's what you're saying? Right. Okay. And the LA Times once had an article saying that if you don't have enough dirt, you can make a cone out of newspaper. Just take a whole bunch of newspapers, make a, a cone out of that, tape it up, and then fill the dirt in there. So that's another possibility. If you just wrap them up with paper, period, that'll hold the humidity and anything you want that doesn't heat up on them. Just wrap the stems up. You can put green moss in there. You can put uh, just wet newspaper in there, paper towels in there, cloth in there, anything to keep the dry air from drying up the stems, that works too. Like the tree roses are, you know, tree roses have that three foot trunk on them. You can't pile dirt that high. So they have trouble when, it, when the wind blows. It's, it's nasty. And I forget, you said leave the, the uh, mounted dirt on there for how long? Until they sprout. Until you sprout. see the new growth come and then you just wash the dirt back mm -hmm. off. And if you use the dirt from the old rose bed, it's not a big deal for just that purpose. You know, if you used all your good soil right here, and your, your old soil, you can mount it up over the foliage, over the stems temporarily, and just wash it back off. That's fine. I mean, back in the 90s, we just, I 
when we had our old rose guide, it showed just to put the dirt on them until they sprouted out, no matter what the weather was like. We had a lot of drought years. <laughs> Now, most books say don't feed them until the leaves sprout. Uh, it's not a that big a deal. We feed our rose when we plant them in the pots. So when we plant them in our containers, we put them in our acid mix potting soil. We cut them really short. We cut those stems down to maybe two or three inches. So we don't have to worry about them drying up because they're so short. Plus the lip of the container helps keep the wind off of them. And we set them kind of in the quiet area of the nursery so they will sprout without any problems. So if you wanted just to cut them real short, you know, if you've got an area out in the, on the parking strip somewhere, you know the wind, it's always windy and dry, you just cut your stems real short. Most of the wholesale rose growers that pot up thousands and thousands of rows and pots, they cut their stems down to just a few inches. Here's a question. What's the best size to put for potted roses? Do I have a patio garden? What's the best? Well, a rose will easily fill up a 15 gallon bucket, but a lot of people like half barrels. I mean, the roses can get pretty big. Yeah. So, I mean, the first year you can get probably get by with a 12 inch oh, pot, right. okay. but, even, pot. but even then, you know, by summer you'd have to water that thing every day. Whereas a pot this big, you know, um, it'll probably hold it for a couple days without having to water it that, you know, that frequently. And it's okay to leave it in there for a few years during a few blooming seasons? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 15 gallons pretty big. So 15 gallons really are only about 12. <laughs> EPA is getting on the nursery and saying, you can't call it a 15 gallon anymore. Okay, so rose food wise, they're not that picky. I mean, they make a, you know, fertilizers in general, and we'll have a class on that next week. Uh, you can feed every plant in your garden the same fertilizer. It's not that big a deal. They, it's, this is all marking when they put the label rose on it. It'll work for anything else, fruit tree, what off. But uh, um, now most rose fertilizers, they have uh, higher phosphorus content. So like this one says 462 with the middle number being the phosphorus, they make it higher. Um, don't worry if the fertilizer doesn't have that or ground, if you're, especially if you're in the ground. The ground here has more phosphorus than the plants will ever need. So that's one item we don't have to add. It's the first and the last numbers that are most important uh, to the soil around here. Now in a pot, this is fine. You can, they can use that high middle number. This is an interesting product. So this is organic. This is organic, which are better in a long haul. One of the fertilizers that works for all happens to be a chemical fertilizer, Magnum. You know that was named by a guy. <laughs> uh, Magnum Rose Food. But this is interesting because this is a chemical fertilizer. Works Chemicals tend to work faster than the organics do. But this was made by Tommy Cairns, who was a chemist who volunteered at Rose Hills and Whittier. So he analyzed the soil there, the water there, said this is what the roses need, put it all into one thing. This does work quite well because this is meant for this climate and this soil. Uh, so it does work well. We have to use this Osmocote Plus for our roses. Uh, the analysis is 15912. So higher first and last numbers, uh, but it's got eleven minerals in it. Now plants need thirteen. You have to add thirteen. Plants are made out of seventeen, but some of those uh, hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, and um, hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, and aluminum are so present in everything. <laughs> that you don't have to add, you know, it's water and air, has hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon. So you don't have to add those. There's four you don't have to add. Uh, so there's 13, this has 11 of them. And this also, I believe, has 11, 10 or 11 of the 13. So they're pretty close. If you get an organic fertilizer, all 13 are in there. In fact, all 17 are in here because 
these contain ground up plant parts and animal parts. So humans and animals are made out of 16 minerals, plants at least 17 minerals. But, you know, if you get a lawn food, it'll probably work. So. Now, the pests that you encounter <laughs> roses, um, yes. How often do you say to, to feed them? You just look on the labels and they'll tell you. So some of these things, like this is a time release. That's why we used to hear it lasts up to six months. Most fertilizers, well, the most liquid fertilizers, water-soluble ones like this, every two weeks. That's about as long as they're going to last, about two weeks. Because every time you water, they keep flushing away. And then the organics, most of them will be once a month, but if you put a whole bunch on, it might last up to three months. In fact, uh, one thing I forgot to mention, so in my own rose garden, you have the roses um, planted. And once they start sprouting, you need to level off the soil again. And then I usually cover with them. Uh, you know, if you don't cover your dirt, you're going to get weeds and all kinds of stuff going on. So what I usually do to cover it, and you can renew this every year, I'll put down some of this garden compost. And there's a lot of brands. This happens to be a generic brand from Ready Grow, but Evie Stone makes one, Kellogg's makes one, all the different. Manufacturers make a similar uh, nutritious compost, a little bit of chicken, a little bit of, of miscellaneous green mulches, waste products, and things like that, and put it in a bag. So I cover that usually half an inch to an inch deep over the whole bed for nutritional purposes. In fact, uh, that alone seems to feed my roses for six or eight months of the year, just that. And then on top of that, I'll put on two inches of something coarser to ke really keep those weeds down and last the rest of the year. So this one tends to last about a year before it disintegrates. Some things last longer. If you get those real chunky bits of bark, they can last three or four years. Uh, back in the day when we had redwood sawdust, I put redwood sawdust in one of my first beds I ever did. Never had to replace it. Redwood just de decomposes really slowly. They said seven years before it decomposes. So not in a much nutritional value there if it lasts that long, but certainly it kept the weeds out for a long time. So you just kind of layer them over the soil. So that nutritious layer, and then the bark layer. And if it's on the stem, it doesn't hurt them. And that'll keep the weeds down, keep them well fed. You're in good shape that way. And then you just water a lot. Now, most people who grow roses as a hobby water them daily during the warm weather, say. Um, around here, you can pretty much water daily April through November. You may not have to water much, but watering daily is a little better than watering once a week or twice a week. Now, there are some rose gardens that are set up with two, spring, two irrigation systems. So the famous Portland Rose Garden in Portland. And Portland, truthfully, is kind of like mm, what's well, inland 70 miles. So it's actually in the summertime, it's rather hot. Um, not like San Bernardino hot, but uh, close, Pomona. Well, it might be a, a decent uh, analogy to Portland, but what they say they do is they have sprinklers and they have drippers. So they drip irrigate to provide the moisture to the roots, but they sprinkle the foliage every day, they said. And that has kept them a lot of the diseases off them because the diseases don't like that splashing water. As long as it doesn't stay wet too long, it really helped with the mildew there and other disease to just wash them off. So they turn on the sprinklers, they said, every morning for about 20 seconds, just to get, and it, keep, and it washes bugs off too, they said, it knocks the aphids off of them. So they've uh, used, I think they said they cut down about 80% of their pesticide use just by sprinklers alone. Now, 
back in the 60s and 70s, we didn't have all the chemicals we do now. And one thing I remember my father doing is going out to the rose in the morning and washing them down. Get that mildew off the foliage, just hit it with the hose water. So that's the way we used to do the roses, <laughs> is clean them up with water. So you can do that. And again, you're doing that April through November or all year round? Well, we water them. But I mean the washing off. Oh, whenever you have the problem. Now, um, mildew, <laughs> which is our biggest problem here, is powdered mildew, is late April through the end of June. That's mildew season. And then again, in the fall, if we have humidity. But mildew does not like it hot, doesn't like it above 90, doesn't, doesn't like it below 55. So mildew season is late April through uh, June. It used to be, you can time it, you know, exactly, but our weather's so weird now, we get April weather in January sometimes. But uh, back in the 80s and 90s, when I used to take care of thousands of roses at the store, I was our rosarian in those years, like the yeah, third week of April, you had to start watching for mildew. Now, back in those days too, the only thing we had to use was an oil product. So neem oil is kind of harsh. There's another oil I have on the shelf. This is called horticultural oil, which is a refined mineral oil. Neem oil is an organic oil, so it's got a bigger name, but this actually burns roses easier, especially Double Glide and Paradise. You spray this on them, you're going to get burnt foliage. They just burn real easily. Uh, the horticultural oil, a lot less burning. It's cleaner oil than the neem oil. But uh, back in the 80s, when we didn't have as many rose problems, we would just hit all our roses with the oil once a week. The leaves glisten, you know, look like you'd oiled them up. Uh, no aphids, no bugs. I mean, we didn't have to do a whole lot with them. The oil did everything. But then the 90s hit, we got black spot from back east, downy from Australia, or wherever that disease came from. All kinds of problems. Then we had to start using the heavier chemicals because, uh, you know, for uh, at least for the nursery industry, you can't afford to have your roses look terrible in your own home. Never had to do that kind of stuff because even if you picked up downy or black spot, it was just a temporary thing. But for our plants at the store, we didn't want to see that on the plants at all. So we were we had to buy all these uh, really heavy duty chemicals. I mean, the in the rose among rose professionals, um, some of the products that we've used to keep the Disease off, Banner Max, uh, Compass, Heritage. These are names you'll see among people who are who have the big rose gardens. They'll use those those chemicals. Um, we're just a few roses. You know, things from Bayer are fine. If, and you can get them. Yeah. And in my house, I don't use those. I just use the oil products, uh, Captain Jacks. Dead bug brew, these are good enough. Generally, they're good enough. So, mildew, powdery mildew, has been our worst problem. When we had El Nino's in the 90s, the thing that really scared everybody was downy mildew. And this is the one that came in from, we think, I think it was Australia, New Zealand. And we haven't seen much downy around. I mean, we get it. You'll get it if your roses are packed can to can like they're in the nursery, but in your own home garden, you may never see downy. But what downy does when it stays wet and it's cool is that the leaves on one plant will just turn yellow and drop. Powder mildew does, it's not a systemic disease. It's just in the leaves on the ends of the branches so powder mill, you cut it off, you've gotten rid of it, but down it gets in the stems. It causes lots of trouble on the plant. It may kill a real small plant, but uh, downy doesn't like heat, and, but it needs it wet and cool. And that hasn't been in Orange County weather for a long time, but back in the mid-90s when it first came in, boy, the big rose growers like Heinz was in Irvine, they were panicking because all their leaves were turning <coughs> yellow and dropping. 
because it was it rained some of those years till June. So um, and they couldn't clean up the roses. So they were they were showing me some of the things they were doing every time they they had pruners with little uh, bleach bottles on the blades. So whenever they made a cut, it would spray bleach on the cut because they didn't know how it was spreading. <laughs> So it was crazy what they were having to do to stop the downy. Um, downy happens, this product here called Garden Foss will take care of downy if you get it. I mean, you probably never get it. If you get it, it's not a big deal. Uh, Garden Foss is an interesting product because in many states it's not even registered as a chemical because it is actually a fertilizer. It's uh, mono and dipotassium salts of phosphorus acid. So it's, there's no waiting time. You can go back, and, you know, most of the chemicals that are poise, considered poisons by DP, they have, they tell you can't re-enter for four years or four hours or until it dries off or 12 hours or something like that. They'll have that on the label. This one, there's nothing written because it's not a poison, it's a fertilizer. And it just happens that the phosphorus, you raise the phosphorus content in the plant, and it fights off diseases very well. Not all the disease, doesn't work on regular mildew, but on downy, it works good on certain root rot diseases, it works really well. We were actually given, sent letters by the University of California saying this is a miracle cure for avocado root rot. You can take a tree that's on its last legs, inject this into the trunk, and it comes back. So, uh, it's used a lot in the trade now, um, and it's not really very dangerous. Yes. Oh, yeah, you had recommended that for downy on that one giant rose I had, and it worked. But you, I've been spraying the leaves, and it seemed to get under control when the weather changed too. Do I treat the soil too with it? Since it is there's a many ways. Yeah, thing? there's many ways you can use it. So on, they sell on avocado orchards. They'll just put this in their irrigation system now and then. So you treat the soil and the leaves because if it's in the stem, it's got to. Right. Be you can it. treat it in any way. You can spray it on the trunk, you can spray it on the leaves, you can spray okay. it, you can put it in the dirt. Okay. Yeah, it did somewhat fix it. Mm -hmm. Now when we get rust and black spot, we just pick off the bad foliage. That's pretty much what we do when we see those. If you're on the east coast, it's a major issue with the rain all summer, but here we get the rain now. Timing is important too, so in my rose garden back in the 1980s, there was an article saying, why do we prune our roses in the winter? You know, prune them back and strip them off and get them restarted in the winter when uh, the rains are the main things that cause the diseases, you should wait till it stops raining. So at that point, yeah, I totally switched from pruning my roses back in December or January to pruning them back, if you're gonna prune them back at all, prune them back in April. By April, the rain is pretty much over, or it's gonna be within the month, so you prune them back in April, uh, no leaves for a couple of weeks. If the rain hits at that time, no problem. Um, and get all the diseases off your plant, and then the new growth comes out, it's not affected. But if you prune them back in January, and then the new leaves come out and it starts raining on the new leaves, and you have to treat them for black spot and rust after that. So uh, I just let the last year's leaves handle all the black spot and rust, and then clean them up once the rains start down. Now usually in April, all the new growth is coming out from the base of the rose plant. So you cut them back no matter what. Because <laughs> that new growth won't wait any longer than that. Now, pruning technique is not talked about as much. In the old days, we had books written on how to prune roses properly that was written <laughs> rosarians. Nobody does those anymore because apparently it don't matter how you prune roses. <laughs> the main thing you want to do is after the flower is done, if this thing doesn't fall off and they start making a seed, that'll stunt the next round of flowers, so you make sure you pinch that off. But, you know, in the last 20 years or so, they actually have pamphlets now on how to prune roses quickly with a chainsaws. <laughs> wow. <laughs> because they can't find enough volunteers to prune the rose gardens anymore, so they just chainsaw them. And what they did was they did a study in England where they had 50 roses on this bed, 50 roses on this bed. They had the best rosarians in England pruning this, these, and they had chainsaws doing this side. And they counted 
over the years how many quality flowers they had on both sides. And in the first five years, they can't find any difference. They're going, this is crazy. The chainsaws are doing just as good as Roseanne, so they ran it another five years and still found no difference between the two sides, so they gave up. Apparently, it don't matter how you prune the rose, as long as you can take off the old um, little flower heads, it doesn't matter. So, uh, so you can throw all the books out that told you how to prune them now. You know, if, if you ever want a prettier plant, yeah, you prune them yourself. You don't use chainsaws, but uh, <laughs> but apparently they still make good flowers if you if you don't know how you're pruning. So they do say, you know, if you have a bush, you, you don't do this with chainsaw. You come up from the bottom and go through it like that from both sides. So if you want to know technique on chainsaws. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, bug wise, <clears throat> every spring the first growth gets aphids on it. Let's see if this picture of aphids is good enough to see, but uh, probably not. But aphids gather at the stem tips of each branch as it's growing and suck on it. Generally, at my own home, I don't treat that at all. Um, by the time the first blooms are open, the aphids are gone. The, there's three or four different kinds of predator bugs that are out here that'll eat the aphids up if you allow them to. Yeah, it's got, you couldn't see this from the back, but uh, the green things up here are aphids. They're small. The thing about aphids are is they're one of the quickest reproducing animals known. <laughs> Besides, uh, you know, um, amoebas and single-celled creatures. Um, aphids are born live, uh, not laid by eggs, they're born live. And the, when the day they're born, they have an embryo inside of them that has the embryo side of it that said five generations are born at once. So one, one aphid can become 100 aphids by the end of the week. So one aphid flies to your plant and gives birth, live birth, to four or five aphids that have babies inside of them <laughs> that give live birth within days to more aphids. So you can get a whole colony in no time at all. This is a lacewing larva eating the aphids. So lacewings, ladybugs, of course, will eat them. Uh, there's little tiny wasps that eat them from the inside out. Um, the most effective predator I found are the surfeit flies, which I thought were bad when I first saw them. I thought, boy, this is an ugly creature, must not be a good one. But uh, you might not be able to see it, but this is the green maggot. So green, if you see green maggots on the ends of your roses, and they look terrible. I mean, they look gross up there. You know, they don't have a head, they don't have legs, they're just kind of inching along the branches and they slurp up aphids like crazy. They clean off a whole branch in a day. It's crazy what they can do. But their adults are the bee flies. So if you see a, a fly that's hovering, they call them hover flies too, and they are striped like a bee, but they definitely don't look like bees. And they just kind of do this. They kind of hover and then they shoot down and come back up. And every time they go like this, they're laying an egg near the aphid colony. And they'll do that all spring long and take care of the aphids on the rows. Now, in the nursery, we used to, we'd always spray for the aphids. We used to use a product called orthoorthine, but what, that's a real big no-no. Don't use orthine on a rose, because you put orthine on a rose, and the spider mites love it. And the spider mites are 20 times worse than aphids are. So back in the 80s, we would spray orthine to get rid of the aphids, and all summer long fight spider mites. And it's just horrible. Spider mites are little tiny spiders that make webs around the leaves and it turns everything grayish. Uh, the result of too much pesticide use killing off all the predator mites that eat the spider mites. So you want to make sure you don't use products that hurt those. Uh, the bear products aren't so bad. The oil won't hurt the, uh, sp uh, the good mites either. Um, in fact, oil is about as effective as you can do against spider mites if you get them. 
But back in the 80s, before we had the good oils, we would have to strip every leaf off the rose to get rid of the spider mites and then hose them down real good to keep the mites off it for a while. And the new growth leaves would come back. Sometimes they get spider mites again. We would fight them all summer long. But nowadays, you know, in the mid 90s, we stopped using ortho, orthene, orth and stopped getting spider mites at all. So it was that one product that was causing all that problem for us. Now, you can also get holes in the leaves, especially near the coast. You go down to Laguna or San Clemente, a lot of rows get laced out on the leaves. And that's called a row slug. The row slug is not a slug at all. It's a larva of a type of stingless wasp that eats holes in the leaves. Uh, the Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew, which is one of our most valuable products. This is an organic product that will kill those and any other chewing bugs. So, Sometimes you get holes in your flower bud themselves. Either caterpillars do that or grasshoppers do that or green fig beetles do that. And this will control all of those critters. Um, do anything that eats holes, this will take care of. Better than BT. BT was only for caterpillars, wouldn't control the beetles or the wasp larvae at all. This will take care of all the holes in the roses. Unfortunately, snails don't seem to like roses that much. Um, the big bug problem we've had lately, the one that's kind of messing us up now is uh, chili throw. So this new bug came in from India, made it to uh, Florida, Texas, Mexico, came into California two years ago. Um, it's a hot weather insect. Fortunately, it's a hot weather insect, so it only affects us for a few months. Uh, down in Florida, it's hot for about five months of the year or six months of the year. You know, it's above 80 constantly, and that's when you get chili thrips. And chili thrips will attack almost any new growth on almost any plant. So roses are have new growth all year to get the new flower buds out. Well, the chili thrips will just make all that new growth on the end of the branch turn brown or gray because they're, they're slicing it up. Chili thrips, which are about the size of a little sliver, are kind of a long-shaped creature. <clears throat> and what they do is they slice a hole in the tenderest part of the new growth, the, the leaves, the stems, whatnot, the buds, and whatever oozes out of there, they lap it up. And that's how they feed. So they're slicing and dicing all your new growth on your roses. It all just turns ugly and shrivels up. So for um, the first sign of heat till the end of the heat, you cannot have any new flowers at all, certain areas. The center of this attack seems to be central Orange County, say from Tustin to Huntington Beach area. Not so much, for some reason, not so much in Liso Viejo or Mission Viejo or Foothill Ranch. Uh, but it seems to be more the center. I'm not sure why that's happening. Uh, we see a little damage in South County, but not much, not like here, where every single flower bud gets totally messed up. This year, the heat didn't come till August. We, it started getting hot then in July, so we saw this critter attacking the roses August, September, maybe a little into October. And then that was it, just three months. Last year was more July, August, September. This year it happened a little later in the year. This so happens that Captain Jacks does a good job. Now Captain Jacks, unfortunately, the way it is in this bottle, it doesn't stick to the rose leaves at all. So we should have brought it over. Whenever we spray anything on roses, except for the oil, oil doesn't require it, but whenever we spray anything else on it, we have the spreader sticker, which is a soil oak common, so, soap and oil combination. Add it to the concentrate of Captain Jack's and then put in your own sprayer and spray it on. You can put a few drops of this in here and it'll do the same thing, but 
It makes it stick better to the waxy surface of the leaves and flower buds. <coughs> so that's real important on roses. Well, we use this on every plant we spray things on. Because our tap water is too hard. When you add the tap water to the chemicals, it just beads up, won't spread on it very well. So this is important to put in there. But chili thrips, uh, in fact, uh, University of Texas said the two most effective ingredients against chili thrips, one is the Captain Jacks, which is spinosad. And the other is imidacloprid found in all the bear products. So these two are the best two chemicals. For nurseries, they tell us alternate, alternate use. Use this one once, use this one once, use this one once. As a topical spray, to spray it on the plant this last one month, this last two weeks. This imidacloprid in here can also be found in a systemic like this in the last six weeks. And they, there's another one on the shelf, same chemical by a different company other than Bayer. If you don't like Bayer, use that one. Uh, Bonide, and lasts up to one year in the rose plant. <clears throat> So those that made the chili thrips a little more, uh, and if you want to do it organically, then use this. In fact, if you want to do chili thrips organically, it's still nice to alternate chemicals. Use this, and you then use the oil. The oil is not nearly as effective, but at least it's something else that has some effect on. So a lot of people on their vegetables do this one, and then the oil spray alternating back and forth. Because the chili thrip named after chili. It totally messes up chili plants terribly. Tomatoes, chilies are the worst two, but there's a list of about 200 or 300 plants that the chili thrip goes after the active growth on. I mean, we've seen it mess up ginger, bananas, lots of different lilies, grapes, guavas, fig trees. Figs are really bad. The fig trees are on fast. All the new leaves just get totally messed up by this bug so it's going out you know if the plant's not growing fast it doesn't attack it so you don't notice the damage that much in your own home but in a nursery since everything here is growing like a weed or we want it to grow fast we have to really uh, spray a lot to control this guy nasty new bug in the nursery industry yes on the the uh, blueberry or the clover it says on the bottle not to use it in pots i have a lot of roses in um, it flushes through too easily. That's why they don't like to put it in pots. Um, I would tell you if your pot's sitting in an area that doesn't drain to the street, uh, it's not a big deal. But they don't want it to go from a pot to the sidewalk out to the street to get to the water system. That's the main thing. They make tablets with that same chemical that are fine for pots. So in all the malls, indoor malls, they use tablets of imidacloprid. I don't sell that product. Uh, Orange County Farm Supply sells it. So you can buy, they look like big pills, and you sit so many pills in so many inches of pot, and that'll work. And there are other systemics that you can put in pots too that are probably a little bit less likely to, to flush out. Uh, we used one called Safari on the Citrus, which is close related to this stuff set of this, but Safari is like $250 for the smallest container that you can buy. So uh, <laughs> so it's kind of expensive. It's a, it's a commercial cult. You know, I culture product, not a homeowner product. That's pretty much all the bugs you have to worry about. Um, grasshoppers, you have to hand pick those. They don't no chemical kills grasshoppers. Um, okay, some of the roses that we really like. Gary, is, you know, there's a million insects and pests of which <laughs> I tend to think nature has them there for a reason. So I hate to go after probably any of them. Mm -hmm. I, I love ladybugs and, you know, whatever. But is there one in our in, in our home gardens? Is there one pest for our roses 
that should put us on high alert. Gross. The problem is... But you can't see them until the damage is done, right? Oh, I mean, yeah. I mean, on all honesty, 75-year-old eyes out there, and if you have a little... Well, the way you check for a thrip is you take a piece of white paper out there and you slam the rows against it, and they're about the size of slivers, but I did this once uh, last year with a lady's rose bush, and there was uh, at least 50 specks running around in that paper. <laughs> they were moving as you, as they hit the paper? Right. You, you can see them easier on the piece of paper than you can on okay, the Okay, then that makes sense. But there's there can be a hordes of on one branch. It's terrible. Okay, but that makes sense then, just to do that. Yeah, there have never right. been, we've never had a good natural predator for a thrip. You know, the old, we've had always had thrips here on roses, but they only affected the flower petals, not the whole bud. And they only liked the light colored roses. That was the western flower thrips so every spring in the nursery. Your white or light colored roses would get brown edges around their petals. And you'd hit the buds with uh, one of the sprays for a few weeks and that'd be over. This chili thrip is just nasty. And, they're, and I don't know Hopefully we'll have some natural predator that goes after it. Sometimes, you know, you get a new bug in and they'll either get the natural predator for it if they can find one, or one of the native bugs starts eating it up and then the problem kind of goes away. We're hoping that happens on chili for a too, but it is bad. <laughs> it is a really bad bug. Aesthetically. It won't heal to kill a rose plant at all, but aesthetically it's really bad. This is big enough to see. Okay, so the original rose flower has only had five petals. This happens to be real famous rose called Altissimo, which we have this year. It's a, either a tall, slender bush or used as a climber on a fence. It is one of the prettier roses, but it is called a single, and they call it single petal. It's got five petals. So it's got one layer of petals on it. So that's Altissimo. Actually, the most popular rose in the United States right now being sold is a semi-double with a few more petals called Knockout. So that kind of saved star roses. They said they make all their money on this one rose that's really popular in the Midwest. You won't see many knockouts in Orange County because it comes down with mildew. But in the Midwest, it's, it's totally resistant to frost uh, all the way up into Minnesota, apparently. And it doesn't get black spot or a lot of the other diseases. So knockout kind of saves star roses. They sell millions of one rose every year to you know for street use. It's not really much of a home garden rose at all. Now they do mention that in general most roses can make a certain number of petals a year. So if your rose has fewer petals in the flowers, they can make more flowers. But that's knockout. Um, we've got a knockoff out of knockout <laughs> and it's one of the one, new ones this year it's called top gun you know that was named by a guy too <laughs> but what they did is they took knockout roses and got the seeds from knockout to find a, an offspring knockout that was more disease resistant and then they crossed it with a different rose they crossed that one with memorial day to make top gun it's a little it's a darker red um, and it's, they said it's also resistant to rose rosette disease, which is a new up and coming disease. It's an old, I don't know, rose rosette is a terrible problem. Um, that totally is man's fault. So some nut brought it 
you know, parts of the United States, there's these wild roses that are a pain to deal with. So some guy brought in a disease called Rose Rosette to kill off the wild roses. And he says, no, this won't spread much to other roses because a mite has to spread them. Well, now it's taken over the U.S. So Rose Rosette makes all the growth real tiny and cluster. Uh, one of our rose growers got hit by it this year, so that's why we're limited in our rose selection this year because they had to destroy part of their crop to get rid of this disease that some nut introduced to the United States to kill off wild roses. It's, you know, it's right. silly. Now, one of the best roses of the old days, you know, back in the 60s, mid 60s, early 70s, Mr. Lincoln was the top rose. That was our best selling rose. And among all roses, I would still tell you that the petals of this rose look closest to crushed velvet that you can ever get. Um, so that's an opening bud on Mr. Lincoln. It's absolutely gorgeous. Mr. Lincoln has its problems. Now here's a picture of Lincoln um, more open. So it, as it opens, it loses that velviness. It's not the purest red. It's kind of a dullish, bluish red, they call that. And the problem with Lincoln is it's at its best in April and May, when the weathers are April and May weather. You get to August, and if it's against the hot wall, I used to grow my Mr. Lincoln against the block wall. Every flower bud from July to October would just fry before they'd ever open. They'd just shrivel up and turn black, never open. Look great. April and May, but all summer long they would just fry. This rose cannot take heat. Um, now I moved my Mr. Lincoln from the south wall to the north side of the wall, <laughs> and it was fine. Just keep it out of that reflected heat, and it was fine. But so Mr. Lincoln has his faults. So among the red roses, now a totally different look. This is Traviata, which we carry, because I love the look of that rose. It's a, kind of an old fashioned rose style. 80, it's either got 50 or 80 petals. It's got a lot of petals on it, whereas Mr. Lincoln might have 25. This thing is loaded with petals. And for some reason, these roses don't seem to have trouble opening on the coast. Like when we have the June gloom going or the May gloom going, uh, certain roses that are spiral, like Mr. Lincoln, just get stuck. That the surface tension water just stops the petals from opening. And the worst ones we had were some big pink ones, uh, Miss All American Beauty, Electron, which we have this year, Electron. Never opened it, just sat there in the bud until it fell off. Because it couldn't open with that humidity. Uh, the roses that are shaped like that don't seem to ever have problems opening in that weather. What is that called again? This is Traviata. Traviata. Now, if we're talking about reds, yeah. the most perfect shaped red rose is now considered Veterans Honor, which we have. So if you want to win a rose show, Veterans Honor gives you that perfect spiral shape, uh, perfect <coughs> color, lasts a long time to put the rose people like for rose shows it's it's perfect but it doesn't have much fragrance to it but other than that it's just it's close to being perfect um olympiad also highly rated that came out in 1980 that one looks like red plastic it's so fake looking it, it's really a fake looking rose because the petals look just like red plastic and the thing will last a week out in the heat so those are two top rated red roses for rose shows. Um, of course, we still sell Mr. Lincoln because it's so famous and the, it's got perhaps the best fragrance of any rose. It's really nice. Uh, Chrysler Imperial, <coughs> close related to Lincoln, we couldn't get it this year because of the rose rosette disease. But Chrysler Lincoln are the old fashioned roses. Chrysler may be the only rose ever that will ever be named after a car. <laughs> Mr. I can't remember his name, Lamberts developed it and he called Chrysler and he got two free cars. <laughs> They're naming the Chrysler Imperial after the car. 
I, you know, I don't think that'll ever happen again, but uh, <laughs> named after a car. Um, I think the best overall red, now this is up for, you know, for discussion, but a lot of people say a firefighter is the best compromise between fragrance and shape and everything. I like Ingrid, Ingrid Bergman better. We have both. And I would say in the garden, you can't beat Ingrid Bergman. It's absolutely gorgeous plant in the garden. It's full, you know, it's not, most of the reds are leggy. Ingrid Bergman's not a leggy plant. Stays full to the ground. Um, plenty of flowers, no disease problems. Decent fragrance. You know, if you smell it outside, it's not as fragrant as Lincoln or Chrysler. You bring them inside and our customers tell me, boy, it, it really smells up the house. So Ingrid Bergman, um, there's, you know, some roses are, are given international words. Ingrid Bergman won an international word just a few years ago for being one of the best roses in the world ever. That one's been hard to get. We've got it this year, we had it last year, but for five years we couldn't get Ingrid Bergman at all. And that's someone's fault in the US. Someone, you know, there's one grower who sells the budwood to the rose growers to you to to graft the roses up, they sold the wrong roses, Ingrid Bergman. Messed everybody up for years. <laughs> so now they got Ingrid Bergman back again. That, that's a good rose. If you want the darkest red, ink spots as close as you get to black. Ink spots was developed in the 80s and then since then they, other companies come out with their blackest roses. Still nothing, Quite matches up to ink spots. I think I have it in here. No, I didn't uh, get a picture of that one. And if you're talking about Floribunda roses, showbiz and uh, trumpeter have been the two Floribundas that were been in far superior to anything else out there. So though if you need something less than three foot tall, these two are really short and they always have color on them. Very little disease, especially showbiz, very little disease on that. Trumpeters slightly more disease prone, but still not bad. What colors are those? Um, showbiz is pure red. Trumpeter is slightly scarlet. I've grown them side by side, they're close. Slightly warmer red than showbiz. There's a new one out this year that they had to rename because it was named I can't remember now. They brought it out as a better name than they had to rename it Brick House because they had another rose already named, but they had named it Brickhouse. That sounds like a, na a terrible name. It sounds like <laughs> something that won't sell at all. We brought it in this year. They said it would it would rival showbiz as being the best floor of red, but I don't know. We've heard that over and over. Like someone wants lava glut from Germany. It means uh, lava flow. Uh, that one wasn't as good. There's been quite a few uh, that have not matched up with those two. Of course, we have the, that new one, Top Gun, this year, but that's a little bit taller rose. Top Gun is uh, essentially a rose that belongs in the middle of the street somewhere. So that's your red roses. Oh, of course, we had the Traviata, too. Which is an English style rose. Um, excuse me. Um, how soon after we buy the um, bare root roses do they have to be planted? I mean, like a couple weeks. Just, oh, they'll hold for that long. Yeah, if it, the cooler it is, the longer they can stay in that bag. So keep them. You know, if you can't plant it right away, put it out behind the trash cans where it's cool, or in the garage at least. If you put them indoors, they start growing real fast in the plastic bags you put them in. 
so the try to keep them cool. Um, I mean, the growers can actually store them till May in, in their warehouses. Because, mm. you know, some of the growers that are in Wasco, um, they can't sell them to Maine until May because it's too cold up there. So they just keep them, it's like 48 degrees in their warehouse. And they keep misters on them so they can, you can just store them that, you know, to, if it stays cool, you can keep them a long time. Okay, um, pink is complicated. Let's go yellow first. So on the yellow roses, Yellow has always been a problem because the first yellows, the color was great, but the flowers only lasted one day. They're just, they were just that weak. Uh, Helmut Schmidt, which is this one, was actually one of the first yellow roses they made that lasted more than a day. So this, actually the first one out was New Day, and Helmut Schmidt was off of New Day. New Day didn't have any shape, but Helmut Schmidt could win a rose uh, show because of the shape of the flower. So Helmut Schmidt came out, still considered a light yellow. There are two most popular yellows now, uh, St. Patrick and Radiant Perfume. St. Patrick is called that because the buds, when it's warm, it's eight degrees or more, the buds are actually green. And then they open up to a lemon yellow, changing to a golden yellow. So they actually get darker. So it's not a pure yellow, it's kind of a lemon going to gold on St. Patrick, but that's a real long lasting, slow opening rose. So that that's, is considered the top row of yellow rose right now. Red and Perfume has the color. So if you want something that was a caution flag yellow, or that incredibly deep yellow that's Radiant Perfume. It's also got a fragrance that St. Patrick is a little bit light on fragrance. But Radiant Perfume's not a hybrid tea, it's a, it's a grandiflora, which means that it's at its best when it has uh, up to five flowers on a stem. So the difference between hybrid tea and grandiflora is that hybrid teas look best when there's only one flower on the stem. His roses don't know what to do. Um, hybrid teas, if the, if the stem is really strong, they'll make a cluster of up to five. And in fact, Honor used to make 20 flowers on a stem. But if you let it made 20 flowers on a stem, each flower only had five pelts. It didn't look like the, the rose at all. If you snipped off as the, the stem was growing, snipped off all the side buds, then you'd get one flower with 25 petals on it. But if you let it do what it wanted to do, it'd make 20 flowers with five petals on them. Well, the hybrid teas are considered single stem because that's the way they look the best. It's not necessarily what they want to do. Uh, the grandifloras, which usually make three to five flowers on a branch, if you snipped off the side buds, the center of one flower has got too many petals on it. It doesn't look right. So they can consider Radiant Perfume better as a Grandiflora. A Grandiflora hybrid tea doesn't mean much. Just whatever makes the flower look better. So Radiant Perfume is using clusters, but it's that brilliant deep yellow color that they like. It was developed from Henry Fonda Rose. Henry Fonda had the color, but it looked it was an ugly flower. It didn't have a good shape. So those are your top two yellow. There's not that many yellow roses that we consider superior. Uh, there's a lot of decent ones, but these two are definitely the, the top two that we sell. On the four Bunda side, I'm not sure if I brought this in this year, but Sparkle and Shine has a lot of press, but Julia Child, which is actually a gold yellow, is considered by far the cream of the crop. She selected that one for herself before she died. They said there were 60 of them at her estate. So Julia Child's wonderful Sparkle and Shine is the up and coming new one that might rival it. And that Sparkle and Shine I think is more pure yellow than Julia Child, which is a little more goldy yellow. I think of the old 
yellow four button that used to be the top right one, but I can't think of it anymore. Gold medal? <coughs> and there was, uh, I don't know what call it anyway. <coughs> so yellows, there's still not that many great ones out there. On white roses, <coughs> there's two at the top, Sugar Moon, and Pope John Paul II. Those two, you know, before in whites, well, we had one called Full Sail a number of years ago that, that was decent. But before that, we didn't, we didn't have a white rose that either looked good or had fragrance or was disease resistant or any combination. But these two both, great fragrance, good disease resistance, Big flowers, Sugar Moon being a little bigger than Pope John Paul. Nice form, not much to say bad about them at all. But they're recent, they, they've only been around for about five years. Before that, we did not have a perfect white rose. We used Honor a lot, but Honor had that problem and wanted to make 20 little, little flowers instead of one big one. JFK has always been popular because of the name, but it was pretty lousy rose. Pascali was another famous one, but if it was above 80 degrees, it was about that big. <clears throat> so very small hybrid tea. But these two, Sugar Moon is the top <laughs> rated white right now for the road shows. Of course, in Four Abundance, you have Iceberg, which is... You see all over. Yeah. And it's hard to beat it because it, yeah. it's, it makes its next generation of flowers before the first one's done. So it's never out of color. Iceberg can grow eight foot tall if you allow it to. Usually you see it in the landscapes, it's about three foot. You prune them every three or four months to keep it that height. Otherwise it wants to keep growing. It's a big plant. <clears throat> Not many other whites to compete with, but they brought out a uh, knockout white, or white knockout. We have those out there too. Uh, it's called, in our display, it's called The Knockout White. So it's got, it's in with the T's. Uh, it's supposed to be more resistant than ice. Iceberg actually gets diseases fairly easily, mildew pretty easily, but out on the street it doesn't. Knockout White's supposed to be more disease resistant than the iceberg. That's all the white ones. Now the lavender and purple rows are interesting. Um, Now they've tried for years to make blue roses and it's not working at all. Um, in Japan, someone invested, gosh, with a lot of money, as the Japanese scientists were putting uh, delphinium genes, which are blue flowers, into the rose. They still turned out pink. So apparently they said the acidity in the rose petals is making blue turn pink. So it's not working. So. We may not see a blue rose for a long time. Um, they come up with these though that are kind of a neat color. This is Twilight Zone, which is nice deep color. And actually, we've had this color out there since the 1980s with uh, Intrigue, which is a real plum colored rose. And most of the, almost every single plum colored rose out there is really fragrant and very disease resistant on top of that. So that, that those roses, I think it's just like the red gene turned on over and over and over. So it gets darker and darker and darker, but it is a neat color. So that's Twilight Zone. We also have, uh, Twilight Zone's a grande flora, but it is a big rose. We have Ebb Tide as the Floribunda version of that. And if you like mauve, uh, now normally mauve, Barbara Streisand is 
a real popular one, but that got messed up because of the Rose Rosette disease. Um, Neptune is considered the best pure lavender rose out there. In the old days, we had Blue Girl, Blue Nile, uh, what was the original blue one? Um, Sterling Silver. Sterling Silver was a really lousy rose, but the color was really nice. All, all, almost pretty much all the lavender roses have great fragrance. Neptune is uh, probably the best pure lavender rose out there. And if you want to go floor bun on that one, it's uh, Angel Face. It's pretty nice too. So in the mauve or light lavender tones, those two are the top ones. Orange is real skimpy. Uh, the best orange rose we had ever grown was Cary Grant, but I cannot find that anymore. I'm not sure why they're not selling it. Uh, a lot of times with, with rose growers stop selling roses because they don't propagate well. So back in the 80s, there was a rose called White Masterpiece that was the best white rose out there, but Jackson Perkins stopped growing it. So I asked another grower if they wanted to grow that, and they, they grew it. They said, yeah, we'll, we'll grow anything. But they had a hard time growing White Masterpiece. They said that when they grafted, only about 20% take. So that's why they stopped growing it, because it was just hard to reproduce that rose. But it was, uh, White Masterpiece had like 50 pounds. It had this incredibly big white rose, but they quit carrying it all together. I don't see that at all. And Cary Grant, maybe the same problem, this orange rose, Gorgeous rose, nice orange with a hint of red in it, but mostly orange. I just can't find anymore, so I'm not sure what to tell people. This year we have Dolly Parton, which is orange red. So it's more on the red side, but you can, you know, it's not a pure where you'd call it an orange red. So that's maybe the best orange we have. We have another one called Baboon which is a light orange, which is quite nice. Let me see we have a picture of it in here. Oh, and we have ginger snap as a small flower. And the problem with orange roses, especially the small ones, they don't bloom that much. Compared to other roses, they're kind of shy bloomers. So this is Baboon, but it's kind of a shy bloomer too. None of the orange roses seem to bloom all that much. But if you like orange, those are the, probably the best ones. Um, another orange one we couldn't get this year due to rose rosette was uh, Chris Everett. And that's a pretty nice rose too. Tropicana is still sold, but that's a lousy orange rose. Don't buy Tropicana. If you want spider mites, you buy Trump. Who doesn't want spider mites? <laughs> but Tropicana was an ugly plant too, because Tropicana, it would send off a branch at an angle, you cut that flower off, and then the next branch would grow this way, and cut that flower off, and the next branch, it, it, it wasn't elegant at all. It just went back and zigzagged back and forth. It's an ugly plant. Decent flower, but the growth pattern on it was really silly looking. <laughs> well, of course, the most popular in the world is the bite color, and that'd be your double delight. Oh, that's always beautiful. Yeah. Armstrong actually developed this when Armstrong used to actually be a nursery. <laughs> I don't know, they, they used to do roses and fruit trees and everything. Now they don't do anything like that anymore. But they used to have a good breeding program. But uh, there's a lot of roses that resemble uh, that light, but we haven't found one that's better than it yet. 
I had twins, so I planted double delight. <laughs> I like humor in my garden. <laughs> Back in the 60s, uh, well, late 60s, early 70s, this was the most awesome rose we had, Color Magic. So this one started out real pale and then darkened on the edges, just kind of like Double Light does, but not quite as much. But this one was developed in Southern California and it wouldn't grow any place else in the country. So they had to take this off the market. You don't find Color Magic much anymore, but it was you now the flowers were at you know at least that big. They were huge. I grew that, but it's so cold sensitive that there's no way you can grow it any place but Southern California. Because even in my garden, every winter we lose half the stems. They would freeze. It was this very tender rose, but what a flower! <laughs> that was one of those real incredible ones. <clears throat> We may carry some David Austin roses. So David Austin roses in the U.S. are grown in Texas, and they don't ship till March. So we may start carrying some. But you know, some of the famous English roses, they're, they've got their their fan base too. The problem we had with English roses when they first came out is that they got too big in California. So in England, what grew four feet in England was growing ten feet here. Mm. So they had to find out what. You know, the ones in England that were like two-footers were fine. <laughs> but some of the stuff they were sending us, uh, what was that first one, Thomas? I can't remember the first one, it was a yellow, Graham Thomas. Yellow rose, five foot in England, 12 foot in <laughs> California. <laughs> wow. So uh, they had to figure out what was going on when they brought them here. So are you go have you ordered some for March or not? Not yet. You know, I mean. They don't usually take orders till January. I mean, everything in Texas is, you know, Texas doesn't wake up until, <laughs> until after the New Year's Day. All right. So uh, we still have time. But they, they charge a lot for the roses. You know, their bare roots would have to be, I don't even know if they're doing much bare root. Bare roots would have to be in around $30, and containers are around 50 So they, they, they're real pricey. Uh, one of the new series that came out is called the Iconic series because they have dark centers. Mm -hmm. So they haven't had roses with that, I don't know, it looks like a Rose of Sharon. So we have this one this year called uh, Easy on the Eyes. A more famous one was already sold out so I couldn't get it. It's called uh, Lemonade, Iconic Lemonade. It's yellow with a red eye. So this is kind of a mauve pink with a purple eye, burgundy eye. In fact, they said the flowers start out uh, orangey, orange colored, and then they go to this. So it's a little different. <coughs> Easy on the eyes, but they they're tend to be not real big flowers on the small side. But first time they've come up with the dark centers like that. <coughs> which is an, an old-fashioned looking flower but it, and it's a lilac pink but that thing fragrant no disease problems lasts forever uh, blooms its head off hard to fault that plant at all uh, Meland of France which is partner to Star Roses um, they based the whole series of roses on the East Piaget they call it the Romantica series this is still the best of that group, but, uh, but yeah, it's a wonderful, I don't think I have a good, uh, you know, they don't make good pictures of East KJ at all. On the internet, you can find some nice ones, but I can't find any ones in books at all that I have. <coughs> now, one of the landmark pinks happens to be uh, New Zealand. New Zealand is kind of a coral color. I might I think I, I 
if I have a picture down on here or not. Well, in the 1960s, this was, or 19, late 60s, early 70s, this was the number one Rose at Rose shows called First Prize. So I think we brought it in again this year. It's always been a good selling rose. It's a real tall bud, uh, kind of a swirl of different colors of pink in there, light and dark pink. What's the name of that again? First Prize. Oh, First Prize, yeah. So back in the uh, 60s and 70s, that was the top rated one. I'll mention, I'll just go through these while I have them on the thing. So in the 1980s and 90s, this was the top selling rose at, uh, well, the top winning rose at rose shows was pristine. Gorgeous light colored rose, but it quickly got its um, nickname, the 30 minute rose. <laughs> Nobody wants a 30 minute rose. Because in my house, I'd have my pristine I'd see the bud there in the morning ready to open, and I'd come back at night, and the petals were already on the ground. Oh, yeah. It didn't last, but it was, it was gorgeous because the petals were also embossed. The veining was embossed into the petals, so an absolutely gorgeous rose, but didn't handle the heat well at all. And I'll show you this one. This was the top show rose in the 90s. <clears throat> That's a touch of class. Throughout the 90s, this would win all the awards. It was a trumpet-shaped flower, never opened totally like other roses do. So it always stayed that shape, which the rose people like. <clears throat> and it can be anywhere from salmon pink to coral pink. It just, it would just change with the weather. Bad mildew problem though. So we don't carry touch of class anymore. Currently, the top show rose is Moonstone. Mm -hmm. If it had any fragrance, it'd be perfect. <laughs> it doesn't have much fragrance at all, but it is gorgeous. It's a big flower. In fact, the plant is beautiful too in that this rose tends to have all its branches um, be very symmetrical and candelabra up. So on all the roses be at the same height, with the same big dark green leaves. It just perfect show in the garden at the same time when it was blooming. So that's Moonstone. But yeah, not much fragrance on that. And I don't have a picture of... I thought I had New Zealand in there. <coughs> New Zealand is a mixture of pinks also, light and dark salmon toned pinks. But New Zealand which was developed in 84, was the first, one of the first roses that combined disease resistant leaves with lots of milk, lots of fragrance. Wow. Before that, if the rose had fragrance, it got mildew. Or if it didn't get, if it didn't get mildew, it had no fragrance. When New Zealand came out, it had both. So they used that a lot in breeding. So a lot of the roses, New Zealand, the problem with New Zealand is that the stems on it, well, it's not a problem. Stems are green and they're almost thorn free, but very tender. <coughs> but a lot of the roses you can see were developed from have the same green stems, no, very few thorns, uh, very soft stems, which probably don't do well in, in the northern states. But New Zealand had that combination uh, Long-lasting flowers, good fragrance, no disease, no, or at least no mildew. Barbara Streisand is descendant. Neptune seems to be an offspring. A uh, lot of offspring in New Zealand over the years with that combination of fragrance. So the old ones, first prize and Electron. Electron, you can tell I was made at the start of the atomic age. Electron, the solid deep pink, first prize with that swirl, those were the big names. One other one, Miss All American Beauty, was, those were the big three pinks from the 1960s and 70s. 
Um, <clears throat> they're still good roses. Not known for their fragrance though as much as some of the modern roses are, but still overall good roses. Um, the ones we sell a lot now with the fragrance Peter Mayo. Or Maylee, how do you pronounce that? Um, Strandane. And these are both deep pink, lots of fragrance, a little disease. What do you think of the striped roses? They haven't really been, I don't know, striped roses from distance don't look very pretty. You know, up close they're really nice from distance. The first striped roses that came out back in the 80s, the stripes would fade too fast. But when uh, Purple Tiger came out, that kind of changed the game. So we're carrying Purple Tiger again. It's got um, deep lavender, almost purple, with pink and white stripes in it. And that one, the, the stripes held up nicely in the heat. And then the Sentimental came out. That changed the game, too, with more fragrance. And now, and then we're carrying this year rock and roll. And George Burns seems to have taken over the market on that. So George Burns has been the, the most successful striped rose it seems. Now Parade Day we brought, this is the new one this year, Parade Day, but it's hard to see from the back there. It's kind of dark pink and lighter pink stripes, which is a little different. But George Burns, To us, looks like a um, double exposure, and we've heard that from several people. George Burns looks like a double exposure. Terrible small picture you can't see from the back, but to us, it looks like a a rose that's yellow, deep yellow in the center, lighter yellow on the edges, yeah. overlaid with red and white stripes. So it's kind of an unusual effect. It looks like a double exposure, and it's fragrant on top of that. And then the other new one this year we brought in was Frida Kahlo, if you saw our, mm -hmm. our write up on it. Another striped rose. So they've got a lot of striped roses now, but we have to check them and see how well the stripes hold up. Rosie, if you all, oh, another, and I've always liked the deep pinks. So, Pretty Lady, we're carrying this year. And we know they're trying to copy Rena Hugo. So, for a number of years, we caught a rose called Rena Hugo from South Africa. Gorgeous color, and winning a lot of rose shows, and then it disappeared off the market. We don't know what happened to that one either. So, they brought out Pink uh, Pretty Lady, which I think has some genetics from Rena Hugo in it. Because that's to us, that's a gorgeous deep dark pink. So, is that a bigger flower or a smaller? Uh, hybrid tea. It's not a huge hybrid tea, but it's we had a couple plants last year. This, this so we can see what they look like, and it was pretty nice. We liked it, but it's not a huge flower. It's, any others? I don't know if there's too many others. Uh, some of the ones from France, uh, Princess Charlene de Monaco is a, a shell pink, and that one's pretty nice. It's an English style rose. Um, there's a few new ones that are like that. I can't remember all the names. Any other questions today? Climbing roses. What's your recommend? I have a north wall. Mm -hmm. I'm not crazy about yellows or whites, but I need a climbing rose. Well, the best sign climber is Eden. And, well, okay, the best sign climber actually might be um, the red one, Don Juan. But it's in short supply. I don't know why we can't get it. We've been trying to get it for years, and it's always been, they've always run out. 
But Eden has been a, a really, well, this is a terrible little tiny picture. But Eden is an English style rose. That's it's pretty. deep pink that opens to white. So it's got the white edge, it's got a lot of petals. Uh, from this company, they said this is their best selling climber. And then there's a pink version of it too. There's a red version also, but the pink and the original one are the best ones. Very disease resistant. Flowers last a long time. What is a climbing rose? Oh, it's just a rose that grows long stems. So in nature, roses, climbers are actually rambling roses. They just kind of grow stems that grow like 10 foot out, just ramble over the ground. So you can put them on a fence or on a trellis or on the side of a walkway gotcha. and have them go up. We have an Eden on our front fence climber. might have some open flowers today. That uh, Altissimo red one is pretty nice too. And a lot of English roses turned out that they were the real tall ones were better used as climbers. Fourth of July, which is the striped one, is another real popular one. And we have that one out there too. We also have Night Owl, which is almost a black purple. So that's another climber we have. And the white one we have is Cloud 10 which is kind of a English style white flower, cloud ten. The biggest rose in the world that's a climber too, it's um, Lady Banks. And Lady Banks is real famous in Riverside, all the inland areas carry it. There's a Lady Banks in Tucson, Arizona, it's supposed to cover an area that's 80 by 80. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> but it only blooms once a year, so it blooms, you know, if you go to Riverside, Mother's Day, they're in bloom, the yellow or white versions of Lady Banks Rose. Here they get mildew, so the only place you can really use it is along the street. In fact, uh, in Lake Forest, they're using it along all the streets on their little wood picket fences, or uh, what do you call that, fence that they use but uh, they've got Lady Banks roses because they don't have thorns. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank